thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Rick Vanderslice. I graduated in 2001 and I uh, am the Philadelphia representative on the Vermont Law School Alumni Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Uh, this event is presented by the VLSAA and thank you for joining us. Before I introduce the moderator and panelists, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, please feel free to rename yourselves um, and add your VLS degree uh, year to your name on the Zoom tile. To accomplish this, you just need to uh, move your cursor to the upper right-hand corner of your tile. There's three little dots. Um, you'll see an option to rename. Um, you can change your name, put your class year in it, and that way everybody can, can see when you graduated. Uh, during the Zoom today, uh, we'd ask that you uh, mute yourself uh, in the lower left-hand corner um, and uh, turn off your video so as not to distract uh, with either background noise, movements, uh, what have you. It can pick up on the Zoom and, and distract from the presenters. Um, feel free to enter questions in the chat as we go along. Um, we will uh, curate them and towards the end, start having a question and answer period. Uh, during that time, if, if you'd like to ask a question live, uh, just uh, use the raise your hand feature, which is at the bottom um, of the screen under reactions. There's a little box that says raise your hand and we'll uh, try and call on everybody. Um, before I pass it over to our moderator, I wanna share a quick overview of today's event. I'm honored to be joined by three other VLS alumni, all of whom are leaders in the cannabis industry, as well as VLS's resident cannabis expert. Uh, to kick us off, uh, you'll hear from Professor Ben Varadi, who's the senior fellow for agriculture and food systems and the professor uh, for Vermont Law School's summer session on cannabis law. He'll give us an overview of the state of cannabis law as it relates to owners and operators. Uh, after the short overview, um, each of our panelists will describe the type of matters that they've been working on as it relates to cannabis. And then we'll transition to a discussion which will be moderated by James Pepper, who graduated in 2014. He serves as the chair on the Vermont Cannabis Control Board, or VCCB for short. Um, Allison Nichols Shute, who graduated in 2015, is an in-house attorney uh, focused on delivering effective and engaging solutions for Puff Creative. Uh, Cameron Field, uh, who's a JD from 2013, is the co-leader of the Cannabis Industry Group at the law firm of Michael Best. Um, they all will serve on the panel with Ben. Finally, uh, the event will conclude with a question and answer period. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ben Ferrati. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Rick, for that uh, introduction. Good afternoon to you all. Um, I am uh, truly honored to be here uh, with you all today. Uh, as mentioned, I uh, work the Cannabis Beat within the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems here at Vermont Law School, and I am uh, truly appreciative to join this welcoming, inclusive, and intellectually engaging community. Um, as many attendees are, will know, VLS is rapidly becoming a leading school for cannabis law innovators and change makers. Uh, and among other great successes, I can tell you that having met this summer's cannabis law uh, scholars, they are absolutely going to go on to do great things in this industry and in others. Uh, we're also seeing increased interest in independent scholarship and writing on these themes. Uh, and students in CAFS and throughout the school are really thinking energetically and creatively about this important emerging industry. Um, the theme of today's presentation is the business of cannabis law, by which I'm given to understand we're primarily, although not exclusively, talking about the business of cannabis law as it relates to 
the psychoactive forms of the plant and its derivatives. Uh, and I've been asked to touch on that briefly. Uh, there has, of course, developed a significant hemp industry in the United States following the inclusion of industrial hemp in the 2018 Farm Bill. And for my purposes, at least, we're talking mostly about the messy, complicated, and rapidly evolving area of psychoactive cannabis business law and regulation. Uh, as I've told my students this summer, in my opinion, messy is great. Messy is room for exploration and interpretation and the opportunity to make change, which is, of course, the kind of advocacy where VLS grads tend to thrive. Uh, well, I've worked quite a bit in the industry. Now that I'm an academic, I have the luxury of speaking in the abstract and hypothetical. So we're really just talking today broadly about the industry as a whole. Uh, and while there are many, many, aware there are many, many roles for lawyers, uh, and we're already starting to see opportunities for generalists, for specialists, for house counsel, and of course, for lawmakers. State legal cannabis market in America is not only one of the fastest growing domestic agricultural sectors, but one of the fastest growing industries overall. Uh, the regulated cannabis market currently supports 428,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, that's a 33% increase over the prior year uh, and five years in a row with job growth over 27% representing one of the largest new sources of employment in the country. Uh, global spending on regulated adult use and medicinal cannabis products is anticipated to reach at least $46.8 billion by 2025, uh, just under just under $200 billion by 2028. Uh, it's, it's estimated that some 29% of Americans already consume cannabis in some form, which is about half as many as drink alcohol. Uh, and 92% of those surveyed currently believe cannabis should be legal for medical or recreational purposes. Um, unlike other emerging industries, those meteoric numbers are, are in part representing a conversion from an established heritage market to a conventional one more susceptible of quantification and regulation and taxation. Uh, so what does that conversion look like? Uh, as most of you are already aware, the persistence of cannabis as a Schedule One narcotic in the Federal Controlled Substances Act means that we are experiencing parallel development of intrastate industry for the most part. A significant majority of states are restricting the overall number of available licenses by supply chain function, um, often using local definitions for producers, wholesalers, processors, that is to say manufacturers of concentrate products or, or edibles, uh, transporters and retailers. And we typically see subsets of license types either based on scale of operation or, as I think we'll touch on later, um, identities of those market participants. Um, with issues there of note to small independent business owners, as well as the larger uh, multi-state operators um, who are uh, licensed concurrently in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, of course, along with licensed cannabis business operators, we've got a host of ancillary service providers, right? We've got uh, those specific to the industry, like cannabis specific banking and packaging solutions, and more general, like HVAC contractors and, you know, lawyers, uh, many of whom uh, are going to have significant legal questions of their own and legal needs. Um, federal prohibition and state regulation are really touching uh, every element of business law within the cannabis industry. So finance and banking, employment, food safety, real estate, bankruptcy, marketing and uh, intellectual property. Uh, and there are real legal questions, many as yet unresolved, which present themselves at literally every juncture. Uh, so the bottom line, cannabis business is booming. Uh, business of cannabis law is booming along with it. Uh, and at its heart, you know, the practice of cannabis law is primarily a series of compliance challenges complicated by federalism issues uh, layered on top of the more traditional legal considerations that we face in other agricultural industries. Uh, this year is certainly going to be a big one for cannabis reg uh, regulation and legalization, as was last year. Next year will also be and so on for quite some time to come. It's a, uh, it's a really exciting moment, and there's a lot for all of us to do as we usher in uh, perhaps not a new industry, but a, a new way of looking at a very old and very popular uh, product. And in so doing, maybe finding some opportunities to redefine our business operations to better reflect our present cultural values with regard to the plant, profitability, and, and, and most importantly, uh, our fellow humans. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce James Pepper, JD14. Uh, James currently chairs the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Uh, prior to joining the board, he served as 
uh, Deputy State's Attorney for the Vermont Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, in that role, he advocated for and implemented many of the criminal justice reform initiatives of the past five years, uh, including expanding expungement eligibility, justice reinvestment, bail reform, use of force standards for law enforcement officers, and raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Pepper also worked for Governor Peter Shumlin as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Senior Policy Advisor. Uh, in that capacity, he developed the statutory framework uh, for the first cannabis tax and regulated bill to pass either chamber of the Vermont legislature. Uh, he received his BA in political science from Johns Hopkins and his JD from Vermont Law School. Mr. Pepper. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for that really Great overview and introduction. Um, and thanks for bringing cannabis policy to Vermont Law School. Um, you know, as you noted, we certainly need more experts in the state and the industry and, you know, representing us in the legislature and in Congress. So really grateful for your work. Um, I figured, uh, you know, the most relevant thing for me to do is give a very brief history of cannabis um, policy in this state and then just update everyone on the kind of the two date status of, of um, where the cannabis board is at. So, you know, unlike most states, um, Vermont does not have a binding ballot initiative system that forces action on cannabis policy. Um, we had to get here um, through a cascade of legislative action that really started in 2004 um, when our first medical bill passed. Um, it was a cultivation only program. Um, in 2011, uh, the legislature allowed for the establishment of cannabis dispensaries, but they limited the number to four. Um, in 2013, uh, the legislature went a step further and decriminalized up to an ounce of uh, cannabis. And then um, 2017, we saw um, those civil penalties for, for possession go away. Um, the legislature allowed six plants um, for per household for home grow, and they um, automatically expunge or directed the judiciary to automatically expunge, um, you know, the kind of lowest tier cannabis possession convictions. 2020 or in 2020, um, the governor um, did allow Act 164 um, to go into effect without his signature which created the cannabis board and really set us off on the path that we're currently on. So, um, you know, the board uh, was created during the pandemic at the kind of height of the first wave of COVID. Uh, there were some um, significant delays in um, appointing board members, um, which, you know, we have a part-time legislature. So those delays led to us um, missing our opportunity to develop a market structure that could get uh, passed by the legislature. Um, you know, authorize new positions at the board, uh, approve our budget, et cetera. So um, really uh, we had a compressed timeline, um, but in the past 13 months, um, we've held over 150 public meetings. Um, we've responded to hundreds of individual public comments. Um, I really think that we set the record with respect to getting our regulations through the administrative rule process in this state, at least um, based on the complexity of the rules that we were pro proposing. Um, we've kind of done the just nuts and bolts of building an agency from the ground up. We have a licensing portal that we built um, that is currently open for pre-qualification and for cultivators, testing facilities, and um, so-called integrated licenses, which are available, only available to the kind of existing medical dispensaries in the state. And then just uh, by way of numbers, um, we've received uh, just over 200 applications um, for um, those license types. Um, 180 or 90% or of those are for small cultivators. And, and when I say small, Vermont really um, means small. It's is a thousand square feet of canopy size, which would be really a, a micro license in, in, in any other state. Um, we've pre-qualified over a hundred Vermont businesses, um, and we've to date issued 11 operating licenses. So um, those early delays really, I don't think are going to impact um, the opening of the full retail market um, later this fall in October. So it's really just a very exciting time uh, in Vermont. And, um, you know, a lot of work is it's, it's taken to get us to this point. Uh, and we're starting to see kind of the, the fruits of that advocacy. And, um, you know, our, some of our other panelists today have uh, deep expertise 
in other jurisdictions. So I'm going to start by just introducing Allison Nichols Shute, um, JD 2015. She is um, the in-house attorney focusing on delivering effective and engaging solutions for Puff Creative, a full-scale cannabis marketing agency. She, um, in that role, helps Puff Creative stay informed and legally compliant um, as the regulated cannabis industry evolves, and it evolves very quickly. Um, her background in business and real estate, contracts, um, licensing, public health, health equity, environmentalism, restorative justice, and civil litigation really helped to provide advertising opportunities across a variety of platforms. Um, Allison um, is really, you know, proud of the work she's doing to break down the stigmas associated with cannabis and increasing public awareness of cannabis's um, health benefits. So Allison, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, thanks uh, for the introduction. And thanks, um, Rick Brock and the VLS Alumni Association for having Cam, Ben, and I here today on the panel. Um, just to describe a little bit more about what I do in my role at Pub Creative, um, a lot of it is, is situational. Ultimately, uh, my responsibilities are to ensure that anything that we receive from our clients that's being funneled through us um, is compliant in the states that our clients are operating. Um, right now we have clients operating in 20 different states and three countries. Um, we've started to get some international clients, Mexico, Canada, um, and looking into some European countries as well, which is really awesome and exciting. Um, obviously that's a lot of different states laws to keep up with. So um, we're kind of putting the burden of researching and doing all that on our clients, their general counsel, their attorneys. Um, and then I'm kind of doing like the quality assurance check to make sure that they're interpreting the rules and regs correctly um, so that we are not risking any liability um, from the marketing standpoint. Um, and that applies to like social media posts on Instagram, Facebook, um, any type of advertising, uh, which is, is pretty limited in the US um, and any sort of copy that's going on website, that's going on packaging uh, for our clients. Um, we have a lot of, of diverse clients. We have some growers, some dispensaries, some extraction facilities, white labeling companies, um, indoor grow lighting companies, um, and then, of course, um, the companies that are making the concentrates, edibles, extracts, and flowers um, for retail. Um, let's see, what else? What else can I talk about um, before we kind of dive into questions? Um, so on top of just kind of general in-house duties, um, like managing contracts, negotiating contracts with partners, um, sometimes we we get into like sticky situations where um, there might be some differing views uh, and interpretation of the rules and regs. Um, so I'll be involved with um, our clients' attorneys to kind of hash out any um, things that we're sort of not in agreement on. Um, every client is a little bit different in terms of their adversity to risk. Um, clients who have a lot of money are willing to risk a little more and clients that don't have a lot of money are a little bit more on the conservative side. Um, they're trying to get started up and they don't wanna have any you know, major losses of fees or anything on the starting end because um, it, it's really expensive to get up and running in this market. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, just kind of encouraging our employees to make sure and do their own quality assurance of anything that they're posting or writing, um, making sure there's no call to actions, no call to consumptions. Um, basically our goal is to always funnel anything that's marketing related into a compliance situation. Um, for example, come check out our website, having a um, age gate on the website where you have to enter your age. Um, that's, that's typical for, for alcohol and, and tobacco as well. Um, and just kind of double checking, making sure that everything's running smoothly. 
um, no major issues with any of our partners and just mitigating any liability for our company. Great. Thanks, Allison. Um, so just also before we get started, before we jump into questions, just introduce uh, Cam Field um, from the class of 2013. Cam is a uh, transactional and regulatory attorney with expertise in the cannabis industry and helping startups. Um, Cam is the co-leader of the cannabis industry group at the law firm of Michael Best, where he helps steer the firm's business development of cannabis clients and the um, client service of its diverse portfolio. Uh, sorry, he works with a wide variety of uh, consumer packaged goods companies in both the cannabis and food beverage spaces and is a collaborative advisor who helps companies make significant business decisions, calculate risk, and uh, really just stay ahead of the industry um, with rapidly changing standards and regulations. Did I catch everything, Cam? Is, is there anything? Yeah, that was that? pretty good. <laughs> um, and I'm, Allison, I'm going to be curious to hear, I want to hear how you ended up landing at um, Puff Creative. So I'll give, I'll give a little bit of my, like a quick synopsis of where I bounced around after law school. So I graduated in 2013 from Vermont and I ended up at the firm I'm still at actually in 2013. It's a firm called Michael Best. We've got about 250 attorneys in, I think like 19 cities at this point. I started out doing pure environmental law, um, like water and air, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. And our, we're a general business law firm, so we don't really represent individuals. We don't do family law. We don't do criminal law, but we represent entities and businesses. And I um, started out kind of working with larger environmental clients in 2013. And over the years, kind of changed what I did every two or three years because I would kind of learn a certain area and then get bored of it and jump into a different area. So I bounced around a little bit. I tried some energy stuff. I tried some litigation. And um, my wife is an entrepreneur and started a company that was in the food and beverage space. And I served as her sort of um, general counsel throughout the growth of her company. And it was through that that I learned I didn't care as much about um, the environmental law side of things in business law, but more just cared about the business owners and the entrepreneurs. And um, found that people that were in the food and beverage and kind of consumer packaged good space were more my tribe because it was our friends. It's what my wife did. And that led me into working with more food and beverage companies. And I already had this um, kind of a regulatory angle of what I had been working on in environmental law. So it was really easy to transition to working with people that are regulated by departments of health, FDA, um, just basically interpreting any sort of federal or state regulations and dealing with government officials. And so that translated really well. And I started growing more of a client base in that area and working with um, other clients in our firm that are within our large agribusiness food and beverage space. And then in 2018, uh, my world sort of collided. I'd, I'd always thought I'd um, enjoy working in the cannabis law space, even when I was at VLS back in 2013. Uh, but there just wasn't quite a practice in that area in my firm yet, and it was, or really much of a practice anywhere in the country at the time. But in 2018, when hemp went legal federally, it made it really easy to make a case to our firm that we should have a cannabis business group. We have a huge agribusiness practice already, so I work with tons of vegetable farmers, dairy operators all around the country, and uh, hemp was poised to be you know, a brand new blue sky opportunity. It's a crop same with marijuana. It's just, um, we saw a lot of people that were just doing what other clients were doing instead of growing uh, raspberries, for instance, and having contracts to sell raspberries at their peak ripeness and meet certain standards. Same thing was happening for flour in the marijuana and hemp space. And we already had all these contracts we've been working from from decades that had been honed with certain agricultural clients. And we found that we are a really good match with the hemp and marijuana space. So in 2018, when hemp went legal, we also merged with a firm that had offices in Denver and Boulder that already had been working in the Delta 9 marijuana space in Denver since uh, day one of legalization there. And so I jumped in with them and we formed this official cannabis industry group and started pursuing more clients in the space. And we were one of the first um, 
I want to say, I don't, I want, I want to be humble, but say like a more of a sophisticated business firm. A lot of firms in the space still are like one to four person shops. And a lot of people are working, um, you know, they're basically like a better call Saul in, uh, for, for lack of a better term, they're just, they're basically, they'd probably still be doing this, even if it wasn't legal in certain states and working with um, some kind of sketchier clients within the industry. And that's one of the challenges of the industry is kind of making sure that you're working with good actors and you're not getting dragged into something that might be a little bit more illegal than just on the, the federal scale that we're already used to dealing with for risk here. Um, so I've been working in the space since 2018. It's probably about 40% of my practice right now. I still have some environmental work and a little bit of litigation and the litigation I get brought into both for cannabis clients as well as for other general clients in the, the food and beverage space as well. Um, what I love to do in the space and, and what we, what we try to grow our business is just working on transactions in the space. So our clients range from, we represent one of the largest multi-state operators in the country that's operating in uh, pretty much every state that marijuana is legal in right now all the way down to ma and pa retail stores that are just selling CBD and other things that are hemp derived in states that don't have uh, recreational marijuana programs yet. And then we represent everybody in between and we can serve businesses in the space from their intellectual property needs. Um, we work with companies that are, you know, both in the cannabis space as well as the psilocybin and the MDMA space and all the other Basically, we, we, our nickname for our group is anything that was illegal in the 60s. Uh, we work with those companies. And so we're filing patents in those spaces, trademarks, working with universities on tech transfer from their professors that are doing research in the space and how to monetize that. Um, and we also do a lot of contract and commercial contract work in the space. So I mentioned crops, you know, they get ripe and then they have to be picked. So we do a lot of work with the commercial contracts and the transfer back and forth and making sure everybody's set up for protection from various lawsuits and liability. And um, yeah, I also served on the executive committee of the Texas Hemp Coalition, which uh, THC is our acronym. It is an advocacy and policy organization that's kind of the, the leading organization in Texas right now that um, has the, the legislature's ear and works to work on cannabis policy in Texas. So we are pretty pivotal in defeating a bill that was going to prohibit Delta 8 last year in Texas, which would have killed off most of the hemp, in, hemp, in, hemp industry as we know it, because Texas doesn't have any um, hemp processors. So the industrial side of it hasn't come here yet. So it's mostly consumer. Um, yeah, and I guess I skipped a little bit that I, I live in Austin, Texas now as well. So I started out in our Madison, Wisconsin office and moved to Austin, Texas about four years ago. Great. Awesome. So um, I've got a list of questions here. I'm going to skip around a little bit just to keep our panelists on their toes. Um, but um, I guess, uh, Allison, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, so advertising... Um, is one of the most challenging aspects, I think, of cannabis. I mean, of a very challenging industry. Um, even you know, staunch legalization proponents want to move very cautiously in this space. You know, there's lots of uh, examples from whether it's alcohol or tobacco um, or pharma that people don't want to see replicated in cannabis. Um, you know, for instance, our legislature in Vermont here drafted one of the strictest advertising laws in the country, um, saying that, you know, the intended audience can't be more than 15 percent under 21 years old and um, that, you know, cannabis advertising can't appeal to anyone who's under 21 years old. You know, and they leave it to the board to figure out, you know, how do you distinguish between something that appeals to someone who's 22 but not 20? Um and I'm just, you know, as a kind of uh, marketing expert, um, I'm just curious how you can navigate some of these complex regulations and, and what advice you give to clients when it comes to kind of building a, you know, kind of a cohesive brand. Yeah, it's definitely a very challenging component of what we do and, and um, can cause a lot of headaches on the day to day. Um, Targeted ads are a big a big thing. So technically, 
those are not allowed on um, social media sites or like Google. Um, so Facebook ads, Google ads, anything like that. Um, those are all um, regulated by the Fed and they are not friendly to cannabis um, industry accounts at all. Um, we have a lot of clients who will get their account shut down um, by Instagram or Facebook, not even like, you know, touching into the state regulatory authority. So that is like probably the biggest like monster um, challenge, big dog that our clients are sort of up against as, you know, most of our portfolio, we're looking at uh, mostly startup companies that, you know, don't have like insane budgets. Um, so that's really challenging because we are we work really hard to organically grow um, the followings and to kind of engage with our uh, followers or consumers in a really um, kind of innocuous way. Um, one of the ways that we approach uh, marketing and brand strategy is uh, more lifestyle based versus, you know, posting pictures of the plan or saying like, you know, enjoy, enjoy some edibles with your friends this Memorial Day weekend, like avoiding any call to actions, as I mentioned earlier, um, that is something that's pretty across the board, like not allowed. Um, and um, one of the other challenges we see is just with people in general, kind of tattletaling on companies, maybe they're, they're not in favor of cannabis legalization, or um, they are some of the people who are more concerned about, you know, messages reaching kids or, you know, adolescents or whatever. Um, so these accounts get shadow banned a lot. And that's a real bummer because um, then that uh, limits the visibility, it limits the amount of content that we can post um, or information. So, there, there are some workarounds that, you know, are a little more creative, um, but it's typically just not worth the risk to really push in those areas. Um, as I mentioned before, um, certain clients, um, you know, depending on their financial situation or just their sort of approach to risk, um, are willing to push the envelope a little bit more. But um, we are pretty conservative when it comes to that and just really try to um, use like very organic growth um, through social media platforms, through websites, um, and just kind of approach it from more of like a lifestyle thing, like photos of people hiking or snowboarding or laughing um, and not necessarily like photos or videos of people consuming because that is where you kind of get into those like sticky gray areas in certain states, most states. And um, really it kind of is like nipped in the bud right from the get-go um, with the social media platforms. So they are definitely not friendly to cannabis companies. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I have some specific questions that I think, you know, Ben and Cam really kind of relate to some of your specific experience. But if you have anything you want to add um, on any of these, please just kind of jump right in. I, so I know Amazon, Alphabet and Meta all have like pretty tight restrictions on what you can and can't say and advertise on their platforms and like the biggest advertisers. So, so what are like the main digital advertising and the non-digital advertising pathways that your clients are using? How are like how, yeah, just how are people how are people advertising in the space, Allison? Mm -hmm. They're it's it's really not like what I would consider advertising. Um it's really just kind of like making the brand known and just kind of putting putting content out there. Um and just sort of like I said I mentioned before, organically growing a following. Um there are some platforms that are kind of more cannabis friendly and LinkedIn is one of them um, as far as social platforms. Um, Twitter is very cannabis friendly too. So it's kind of like a different set of rules depending on each different social media platforms, um, terms and conditions, and just sort of their overall philosophy 
with how they view cannabis. Um, that's helpful. Interesting. Yeah. Cam, uh, I wanted to pick up on some things you were talking about. Um, you know, obviously issues come up every day um, in this industry. New things that we didn't know about yesterday become kind of front and center today. Um, and of course, one of those is these uh, novel cannabinoids. You know, we're really just starting to scratch the surface of um, Delta 8, Delta 10, Delta 11. Um, and of course, you know, the, the farm bill and the legality of, of hemp uh, tend to kind of complicate these, what are now known to be psychoactive and potentially harmful um, uh, cannabinoids. Can you just give us a little, you know, you seem to be an, an expert in this field. Can you give us a little bit of an update on kind of the status of the, le the, the, the legality of some of these cannabinoids, how that might be impacted by the farm bill and, and what states should do, what regulators should do to respond to them versus what the industry is doing? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. So for, for people that don't understand, the farm bill legalized um, basically the plant and all derivatives that is both the cannabis and hemp plant, anything that's 0.3% THC or lower. So THC being the main psychoactive that gets you high in marijuana, that's what was targeted by Congress through the farm bill. Um, there is, There are so many different cannabinoids, we call them minor cannabinoids or alternative cannabinoids in the industry that also have psychoactive effects. Delta-8 became really popular during the pandemic um, Delta 10 is one, there's one called HHC. There's a bunch of different things. You can see them in gas stations all over the country. A lot of the time they can get people really sick. I think it's one of the largest threats to the industry right now is the, this growth of the alternative cannabinoid industry. And, um, it's growing and booming because it's entirely, almost entirely unregulated. There's a few States that have started moving in and regulating Delta eight, um, a few States, I believe. Tennessee has one of the best laws on this right now. They're, they're really basically requiring some sort of registration and licensing to sell any sort of cannabinoid at all. So um, not just CBD, but if you want to start selling these other things that are unregulated by the federal government, you have to at least register your facilities with them so they know you, know, you exist and can inspect you in a certain way. Um, but they're, they're a huge threat because it's, it's mostly unregulated. We have people that are it's like the equivalent of bathtub alcohol that people are making these different cannabinoids using different sketchy chemical processes. And they're using a lot of heavy solvents and heavy metals while they're making the, their ingredients and pulling their cannabinoids out. And while they might have a, you know, produce a fun effect on someone's brain, there's a lot of the time, there's a lot of different residual solvents and metals that are in the components. And while they're not being regulated by states, it's a pretty large uh, public health risk. So, um, like, an, so the Delta Eight was really big the last couple of years, and um, I think it's going to continue to be relatively popular because a lot of people got used to it and like it. Uh, but when Ben, one of the some of the things you're talking about, how we're talking about the psychoactive component of the cannabis market, mostly being marijuana largely right now it's interesting because i think the hemp and the marijuana spaces have totally intertwined from a in, in ingestible product category so in austin texas i can just you know we don't have a recreational marijuana program but i can just go down the street and buy delta 9 gummies like you could at any dispensary in denver or any other city that where it's totally legalized but it's totally unregulated here but it's the same chemical component that's present in marijuana that produces that psychoactive effect. But people are now just pulling it out of the hemp plant and essentially they take large amounts of CBD and convert it into THC. And so it's not, it's not only just Delta eight anymore, but it's just Delta nine, which is what everybody's used to. And we're seeing in some States like Colorado, the established regulated marijuana industry is trying to push policy that takes on the hemp industry and the unregulated minor cannabinoids that people are able to just make through synthetic means. Uh, but according to the DEA right now, it's not it, the, what the way people are making them is not necessarily synthetic because they are still derived from the hemp plant. So we're not seeing any action from the federal government on it. And it's really being left to States 
And we're seeing more and more states step in and start trying to regulate the minor cannabinoids. I think ultimately for the ben the benefit of the industry, that is the right way to go because a lot of people don't remember, but right before the right before COVID hit, I think we had up to 1,200 people die that prior year from using uh, THC vapes that had been contaminated with vitamin E and was causing people's lungs to shut down. And that was pretty much quieted once COVID came because a lot more people were dying from that. But we're just always like months away from a bad batch of something from some plant somewhere that's going to shut down a bunch of people's respiratory tracts or brains um, if, if people aren't watching the way that they're making these things and producing them carefully. We had one client who sourced from a particular company who had sourced from another company. It was kind of a chain. And we had the FBI show up at their door because this one individual that was kind of a couple steps removed from our client had sold some uh, ethanol processed. I think it was, I think it was just CBD even, but it was used in an ethanol process and the ethanol, like ethanol and methanol, the, what can kind of screw people up when they're making alcohol that ends up killing people. They had screwed up their ethanol in the ethanol wash and a few people ended up dying that used their products in the kind of in the rust belt states. And so our, our client ended up getting interviewed by the FBI to try to kind of figure out where this individual might be and where their bank accounts were to try to uh, see, seize their assets and kind of stop them from making these bad products. So the, yeah, the alternative cannabinoids is it's, it's really interesting. I think it's one of the main areas we're going to see regulations in. And one of the, also one of the main areas we're seeing growth in, in the industry as well, because it's just simply not regulated. So anyone in, in many States can go out there right now and just start businesses and start selling product without having to jump through any permitting procedures. Yep. Uh, yeah. Our governor just signed a bill on Monday that gave the cannabis board authority over um, all synthetically derived cannabinoids and all minor cannabinoids um, and actually combined our hemp program and the can under the cannabis board's jurisdiction. That's good. Yeah. What, I think the, 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 the dividing the plant into hemp and marijuana has been one of the stupidest and hardest challenges for the industry that we're dividing it among this, just this arbitrary line in the sand of a certain THC number. And I've talked to some people, um, we have a lot of, a lot of folks in our DC office that have ears to the ground on what's going on in the Capitol, the former DA administrators on our staff in our DC office. And there is, there are some murmurings of actually increasing that THC threshold to make it easier for the hemp space for growers but that doesn't do much for the people that are on the ingestible side, making products that have THC in them that are being sold unregulated to people of all ages. So it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge and it's, 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 it's inevitable that it's going to happen, that everyone's going to push the boundaries like this. And so it'd be interesting to see what comes of it. Yeah. Um, ben, you mind if I turn to you? Oh, not at all. I, um, you know, just, just, Briefly following on to that, I'm not sure I'm quite um, as doom and gloom on um, on some of this. I I, I agree that the uh, distinction between um, hemp and um, uh, THC bearing cannabis is, um, is is quite arbitrary. And for those who are unfamiliar, one of the reasons why that THC cap is considering uh, being increased is not only because it's um, way below any uh, potential uh, psychoactive effect as to the unprocessed flour, but, um, but to the point where it really presents uh, challenges for hemp producers who often end up having uh, compliance issues that, uh, through no fault of their own uh, because 0.3% is uh, so arbitrary and so low. You know, that said, I, I do fear that we are on track to be really one of the most regulated industries in history. Uh, and while that may perhaps be appropriate, and when we look at it at the state by state sort of laboratories of democracy model, um, this is a lot of stopgap stop and a lot of regulatory inefficiency because we keep running these parallel experiments rather than kind of saying, okay, maybe it's time that we take a federal approach, you know, and, and so the question, and I'm certainly not uh, uh, desiring that anybody should die as a, in, in order to um, to move forward federal regulation. But at the same time, I, I do think that 
um, we have a, quite a good body of law when it comes to, for example, products liability uh, that, that could perhaps be uh, addressing some of these issues uh, outside of regulation, um, should we uh, be looking at it through that lens. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not disagreeing uh, with Cam, but I, I, I do hope that we don't find ourselves in a situation where we have so much conflicting state regulation that we end up in generations of, um, of uh, attempts to resolve that. Uh, where some federal action is, is really an inevitability and we just need to get there already. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I would much rather the federal government create a very easy, low floor of regulation for the space than seeing it go state by state for both the, the minor cannabinoids and the, and the cannabis. It's one of the greatest challenges for, of growth of any of the, the larger companies that we work with to, to try to expand their business and grow is to deal with the not just the nuance of the different states, but trying to keep track of the changing states. Like a, a quick anecdote, we had a client that spent close to, you know, probably five hundred dollars to $700,000 on labels for their product based on our advice of looking into what labeling regulations existed and kind of what best practices were. And just a couple months later, uh, one of their, one of the larger uh, markets that they operate in adopted a new labeling law in the space. And they started an enforcement action because they found their products on shelves that what it, it had like one word off and a certain disclaimer about Delta nine in the product. It was, it was, you know, the intent was there. Everything was buttoned up except this one word was off and they were going to try to make them, you know, scrap all, you know, millions of dollars worth the product to try to start over like that. Luckily we were able to negotiate with them and let them sell through the product. But it's little things like that, that people just don't deal with in a lot of other industries. So Ben, I was going to ask you uh, about kind of the state of banking and insurance, but I think, yeah, you know, just, I wanted to maybe just continue with this thread a little bit um, in a slightly different way. And maybe I can tie the two issues together, but, you know, the idea of over-regulation and extreme enforcement really cuts against um, the notion of um, social equity and restorative justice, which has really been kind of woven into the foundation of a lot of the more recent um, states that have passed legislation um, around uh, legalization and also kind of been grafted onto some of the earlier states as well. Um, can you talk about kind of um, social equity, the need for it, the kind of um, what, what maybe some states are doing? I'm happy to talk about the Vermont example. Um, and then maybe, you know, how why banking is such a barrier to entry um, and why that can, you know, cut against, you know, people can be putatively a for social equity, but when you add all of these barriers to entry, you're actually um, preventing people that have been harmed by cannabis prohibition from actually entering the market and participating. Yeah, yeah. boy, can I, I, how many hours we got? Um, I, uh, well, can I I'll just pause you, you before you do too, sure, just because of, just because of the timing, if people yeah. do have questions, you know, please put them in the chat. Um, I got the chat open and can kind of try and weave those in as well. But sorry, Ben. No, I appreciate that. You know, this has been the focus of my uh, academic um, scholarship over the last year. I, I just completed a, a draft of what looks like it's going to be a 40 to 50 page uh, report to be published by VLS on the topic. Although in the interim, I'll say that I highly endorse the Minority Cannabis Business Association's report on this topic, uh, which is a really nice 50 state survey. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, when we're talking about social equity within, in the cannabis space, uh, without getting too deep into the history, we're saying, as we legalize cannabis, how do we make some form of amends for the populations that were uh, historically impacted by the so-called war on drugs? And to be clear about that, it is unequivocal that uh, cannabis and, and drug policy in America has absolutely been uh, race-based and classist for a very long time. And as a result, we find ourselves in a, uh, in a situation where many people remain in incarcerated in many uh, communities uh, remain in poverty while the folks best positioned to profit from the industry uh, tend to be wealthy and white. Uh, and uh, in what is somewhat unusual for an emerging industry and for industry in general is uh, the regulations trying to do something about it. Broadly speaking, that uh, focuses in, in three areas, criminal justice reform, starting with legalization, also talking about expungement, re-entry programs for folks who uh, have had convictions expunged, 
Uh, number two would be community reinvestment. So these are programs that are uh, trying to take excise tax raised uh, uh, from uh, cannabis retail sale and, and reinvesting that in prohibition impact communities with the goal of really uh, trying to achieve some level of, of equity and, and, and really trying to bring those communities um, to, uh, to, to the forefront and, and, and to be as, uh, uh, receive as much assistance as, as they possibly can. And finally, and, and the area where I think many of us focus most uh, is, is really in improving uh, opportunities within the cannabis market for uh, within the cannabis industry for members of prohibition impact communities. Um, by far, the biggest hurdle we see when we are um, working with these constituents is lack of access to capital, right? Because we uh, don't have the same level of access to banking. So generally speaking, and I won't take too much time on this, um, retail depository banking is not explicitly prohibited under federal law. There is a, a sort of equivalent to the coal memo within the FinCEN guidance that's implementing um, uh, FinCEN is tasked with implementing the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, so it is in theory possible uh, for banks to um, open bank accounts for cannabis companies uh, of the 10,000 financial institutions in the United States. We know that around 700 have done some business with cannabis companies. Um, uh, but we are also kind of seeing that as a, a niche for financial services. Um, but we are not seeing access to SBA loans. We're not seeing access to uh, federally insured loans. We're not or, uh, federally insured uh, depository accounts. We're not seeing uh, access to most of the traditional lending instruments that we would anticipate. And depending on when states legalize, we also see that when we're looking at private lending and private uh, equity, that um, that we don't necessarily have sufficient levels of scrutiny uh, to ensure that um, the folks who need this help most aren't being taken advantage of uh, in one way or another. I really can talk about this for hours, but I do uh, want to be um, mindful of the time. I do know there's a, a, a comment um, in, in the sidebar, which I'll invite you all to read. Um, you're absolutely uh, right that these barriers to entry are endemic, particularly when it uh, relates to minority populations. Uh, the, the disproportionate is substantially higher in the cannabis industry, uh, significantly higher. And uh, also as an emerging industry, we have a greater opportunity to regulate it. Part of my scholarship is hoping that in doing so, we're gonna identify models that we can then expand out to other industries. Uh, and, and perhaps you know one of, one of the experiments that comes from building opportunity in this space is that we can identify how we can do that in other industries. So oh, I encourage anyone in the audience who has a question to raise your virtual hand or just type it into the chat. Um, I'll try my best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand. Um, and while we wait for people um, to do that, um, Ben, I might just ask a quick follow-up. Um, do any of the kind of federal bills that you're seeing, either safe banking, the um, kind of Blumenauer McClintock Amendment, um, the CAOA, fix the banking situation or does it really take a kind of descheduling of cannabis before we have a more kind of traditional industry, agricultural industry? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think they all claim to. Um, the, the issue, and, and for those who are unfamiliar, um, the Safe Banking Act as proposed provides some safe harbor uh, for financial institutions to engage more fully uh, in the cannabis industry, uh, the MORE Act and the um, uh, SEOA and others are um, taking much more significant steps towards um, legalization or at least significant decriminalization. And, uh, and, and the, the one of the major distinctions between them is incorporating some social equity measures at the federal level. Uh, I think, at, you know, as something of a pragmatist, you know, all of the projections are that safe banking or some other piecemeal approach is likely to um, move forward uh, first, and I think within that, uh, there remains a role for state regulators to kind of step in and fill in the gap. And and and, um, and you know, and, and some of the ways that we see that happening are are not only at the federal level but also at the state level. Um, New York uh, recently uh, announced their public-private partnership, where they are right out of the gate loaning two hundred million dollars, making that available for social equity applicants, and they're doing it. Uh, One hundred fifty million of that is going to be private investment. Uh, Massachusetts is looking at a similar. Project. So, you know, I, I think we have to um, attack this thing from all angles, as you know, our, our commenters are are acknowledging 
this is absolutely a problem throughout um, American society. Uh, it is most pronounced in the cannabis industry. And, and, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll take what I can get at the federal level, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, but we are, I, I think it's, it, it's going to continue to require um, diligent implementation at the state level uh, to ensure that those deals, once they're available, uh, remain fair. Allison um, and Cam, is there anything you want to add on this front? Um, you know, you're advising the industry um, and your clients. What are you telling them about kind of how to embed, you know, social equity principles, corporate social responsibility into the foundation of their companies? And, and is that um, more than just a marketing tool or is that actually um, something that, you know, your clients, um, you know, care about? Um, yeah, just to respond to that, mo we're really fortunate that most of our clients that we work with are really passionate about uh, the social um, equity, restorative justice um, piece, and um, a lot of states are now requiring it. So there needs to be some kind of component where you're doing like community responsibility, giving back to your community. Um, which I think on our last panel, somebody raised like, why is the cannabis industry held to this standard while, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and alcohol industry, tobacco, guns, whatever, they, they run rampant. Um, I think that people do really want to improve. Um, and I am seeing some good policy in some states, um, but unfortunately, just to kind of go back to sort of the barriers of being a social equity applicant um, and advising a client for New Jersey. Um, you know, unfortunately, like the social equity application is very restrictive. It's, um, there's more components to it. So you're going to be paying your counsel more money um, or, con you know, consultants, accountants, um, all the, the expensive startup costs of just even filing an application. Um, I find that it's it's more expensive and time consuming to go the social equity route. Um, it also is really limiting if, you know, looking long term, you want to turn around and, and sell your company one day, retire, move to the Bahamas, whatever. Um, there's a lot of limitations on the sale of businesses when it comes to social equity license, too. And I really don't love that. Um, I'd like to see. um you know, these, these really serve their purpose, which is getting more people into the industry um, from communities that have been adversely affected by the war on drugs, um, from communities, you know, that maybe don't have the, you know, pockets that are as deep as some of these MSOs with, um, you know, white male leadership um, who've got money for days. Um, and they're kind of like setting the standard because they're already in states like New Jersey, MSOs are the only ones that are currently operating. So um, they're sort of setting the standard when it really seems like it should be the other way around. Um, and another another unfortunate thing with just sort of like the um, priorities in policy making. Um, another thing in New Jersey is that um, before you know convictions were expunged and people for cannabis related offenses were released from prison. Um, they codified, you know, allowing law enforcement officers to be able to use the plant um, and not be, uh, you know, not have it adversely affect their employment. And I'm just like, whoa, come on, we got to like, we're putting the car before the horse here, we got to go back. And this is really what these programs are set up to do. So I think, you know, we're, we're learning as we go. Um, progress is progress, even if it's slow. But I really am hoping to kind of push for a more inclusive policy and kind of remove some of those barriers that are sort of like snuck in um, that actually disadvantage social equity applicants. Yeah, well, obviously, this in particular is an area that we only, only scratch the surface of. But Rick, I do notice the time. Um, and I'm sorry that I failed my moderator duties, but we, we're at it. We're over. Um, so I'll hand things back to you. Oh, no, uh, it, it's very interesting discussion, and, and, uh, and I think all the time it was warranted. Um, but yes, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Brock, Laura, and Andy and the alumni office for uh, not only helping make this program happen, but helping the Alumni Association uh, do what we can to 
to further uh, engagement with VLS alums. Um, and I'd also like to thank our panelists for, for a very thoughtful and interesting discussion about the current state of cannabis and, and, and it's how businesses are, are tackling uh, the various challenges um, that we've discussed here today. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone that joined us. Uh, we've been trying as the Alumni Association to put on these panels to, to bring interesting topics uh, to everyone and foster uh, alumni engagement. Um, as I mentioned, the VLSAA uh, produced this event in an effort to provide uh, engagement opportunities. Uh, we all think that uh, VLS is great, obviously, and we'll hope you'll consider helping us keep it that way by making a gift. Uh, there's a link available at the end of the post-event survey uh, to donate to support VLS. Um, as I mentioned on the last panel, it doesn't matter uh, how much you give, just that you give. It's uh, rankings and whatnot are based upon percentage and not necessarily amount of donations. And right now we have one of the higher uh, alumni uh, donation rates uh, that we've had in a while. So we, we would ask your help to uh, keep that going. Lastly, I'd remind you that the final uh, panel in this series is going to be held during reunion. So if you want to join in person, uh, it's on June 4th, 24th. 1115, I'm sorry, at 115 Eastern uh, during reunion. Uh, this one qualifies for a CLE ethics credit uh, for Vermont licensed attorneys. And I suspect other jurisdictions could, could gain some CLE credentials if you applied for it. Um, if you're available to join us for the full reunion on June uh, 24th and 25th, um, registration is open and can be completed at uh, connect vermontlaw.edu. Thank you again for joining us and hope to see you all again soon. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody.